Good. That's a good start. Okay, so that's my background. Um, and the main reason I'm here giving this talk, I guess, is that I'm probably the first person to have done a PhD in generative AI in education. Um, so my PhD was on helping children to develop their creative writing abilities using generative AI programs. And then I went off and did quite a lot of other things. And then um, two, two and a half years ago, suddenly um, new form of generative AI uh, came with uh, OpenAI and ChatGPT. And suddenly I was back on the conference tour again, talking again about my PhD, which was very weird. And the other um, area that I've been particularly involved in is social educational media at scale. So I was academic lead for Future Learn, the MOOC platform, and developed its platform for social learning at scale, and worked with the BBC and the Open University on what we call citizen inquiry of combining citizen science and inquiry learning. So what I want to do in this talk is to try and bring, bring the two together, which is to talk about social learning and generative AI. Uh, and it's based on a paper that I gave called Towards Social Generative AI for Education, Theory, Practice and Ethics. Yes. So this is the basic argument that I'm going to put forward, which is that with each major new technology, whether it's mobile phone, computer games, World Wide Web, we've tended to underestimate the power of the social. So we tended to think of them as individual um, entertainments, individual media, and we hadn't realized that the social was coming. And here are just a few um, quotes uh, about how Fortnite conquered the world, the unexpected health benefits of social media, and from MIT News, why social media has changed the world and how to fix it. So um, social media and social networking is not always good, not always successful, but it's always influential. So if we underestimate the power of the social, we should prepare now for a future of social generative AI at scale. And here's just one headline from The Economist. Um, Today's AI models are impressive. Teams of them will be formidable. So once AI starts to communicate with each other and also with groups of humans, it's going to be formidable. And what does that mean for education when we have social generative AI? So I just want to give you an example. And this is from a video that was put together by the OpenAI company recently to promote its new version of ChatGPT4. And what you will see is the equivalent of a Zoom conference with four humans plus an AI. And the AI you can see, you will be able to see on the left-hand side, all engaging in a live video conference. Um, the topic is about cats versus dogs and which are better to have a cat or a dog. But just imagine that it wasn't cats versus dogs, but it was something a lot more controversial. So just imagine that and have a listen. Hi, I'm Lillian, and today I want to do a small debate about between cats and dogs, uh, which one they like. Uh, I like dogs because it's a great companion to humans. It's uh, cute, it's loyal, and you can play outside. Yeah, I talk now. Um, how about you? Yeah, my name is Ola. I think cats are better because they're more affordable, they're more quiet, they're more independent, and they're longer. Interesting points. Sounds like we've got a classic dogs versus cats debate here. I can see the appeal of both. Dogs are super loyal and great companions. <laughs> But cats have their own charm with their independence and low-maintenance lifestyle. Who likes cats? It sounds like Ola is more of a cat person. And who likes dogs? Else, Lillian mentioned she likes dogs. Anyone else here team dog? 
I'm also a team dog. I, uh, my name is Christine, and uh, I think dogs are just incredible with kids. Uh, we've got a, a huge German Shepherd, and he's great with little toddlers. He lets them play all over them, and uh, yeah, I think dogs are amazing. That's great to hear, Christine. Dogs, especially breeds like German Shepherds, can be so gentle and protective with kids. It must be quite the sight seeing your little ones play with such a big dog. Okay, so that was the AI mediating a conversation. And it's interesting, just the, the last thing that the AI said, it must be quite a sight seeing your little ones play with such a big dog. And of course, the AI has never seen cats and dogs playing. So just the language is already suggesting a kind of human intervention. So that's, that's what's coming. Conversations mediated by AI. So what are the ingredients that are needed for social generative AI? <clears throat> so firstly, the AI needs to have a persistent memory. It needs to be able to understand who you are across multiple interactions and multiple conversations. Well, companies such as OpenAI are already developing that. There needs to be autonomous agents that can engage in social interactions on your behalf. Again, AI companies are already developing autonomous agents that can interact with web services and interact with each other. There need to be AI tools embedded into social media, um, such as Zoom, but also um, other kinds of social networking. Again, AI companies are already developing those. And AIs that can interact with each other, that can hold conversations between each other as well as humans. And already AI systems such as ChatGPT uh, and um, uh, image generating um, software can interact with each other using natural language. So all of those are already under development. But the one I really want to question is, does AI have social intelligence? So what do I mean by social intelligence? So social intelligence is the ability to engage in complex social relations by understanding oneself in relation to others interpreting social cues accurately, sharing emotions, being aware of the effect of one's own actions on others. So does generative AI have social intelligence? And I just want you to have a think about that just for a minute. I won't ask you to interact just for a moment, just have a think. Do you think that generative AI, you know, given that definition, do you think generative AI has social intelligence. Well, <clears throat> um, I did the obvious thing and asked ChatGPT whether AI has social intelligence. And this is what it said. ChatGPT as an AI language model does not possess social intelligence in the way humans do. However, it's designed to simulate aspects of social intelligence through its ability to first understand context. It can interpret and respond to the context of conversations, providing relevant and coherent answers. It can simulate empathy. It can generate empathetic responses based on the input it receives, though it does not experience emotion. And it has communication skills. It can engage in effective written communication, adapting its language and tone based on the user's preference and the nature of the conversation. But despite these capabilities, ChatGPT lacks genuine understanding, emotions, and the ability to form relationships or navigate social dynamics independently. Its responses are generated based on patterns in the data it was trained on rather than real social intelligence or awareness? That's a pretty good answer and a pretty fair answer. It can simulate social intelligence, but doesn't have social intelligence based on human empathy. So that then raises the bigger question. Should we allow generative, social generative AI into social settings, particularly 
into education, into social educational settings. And I want to ask you, just for five minutes, to talk to the person next to you and try and answer that question. Should we allow generative AI into social educational settings? Just turn around and chat with the person beside you. All right. <clears throat> Does anyone want to try and answer that question? Any, anyone want to put up their hand and try and answer that question? Okay. <clears throat> At least you've had a chance to discuss it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I've started it, so I'll finish it. Okay. So let's look at social generative AI in education. Firstly, I want to say that it's, it's going to come, whether we like it or not. AI is going to be embedded into social networks. And as educators, we're going to use those social networks, including, for example, Zoom, Teams. So we need to rethink education for an era where humans and machines engage in large-scale extended dialogues. And I want to take a systems view of this. So I want you to try and rethink what it means for social generative AI to move from an idea of prompts and responses, which is the current notion that you write a prompt to an AI system and you get a response from it towards humans and AI as social agents within a pervasive computational medium. And by that, I mean that with social generative AI, you will have continual conversations online with other people, but also involving AI systems. And it's within a computational medium. The AI will be continually interacting with the web and interacting with other AI systems. For example, we've just seen AI moderating discussions. So humans discussing amongst each other and also AI moderating or managing that discussion. Speech translation, where humans are communicating with each other across multiple languages with the AI as the mediator of those conversations. And AI characters in games, where as a human player, you're interacting sometimes with human, um, other human characters, but also AI generated called non-player NPCs, non-player characters. So you will have many different ways of interacting with AI. Now, interestingly, this is not a new concept. The idea, and those diagrams are reworkings of ones that were um, written about by Gordon Pask in 1975. He was quite an amazing person, if you haven't heard of him. He was one of the founders of educational media. Um, and he wrote in 1975 a paper called Minds and Media in Education and Entertainment where he reconceived that notion of moving from interacting with individual systems to what he called individuals as program sharing and linguistic interaction with the, within a pervasive computational medium. So he foresaw, if you like, humans and intelligent um, computing systems interacting with each other. He was... <coughs> a pioneer of AI in education. He and his colleagues designed the first commercial adaptive teaching system for teaching typewriting. And he also developed a grand theory of learning as conversation, which I just want to touch on now. His idea is that all learning involves conversation. All human learning involves conversation. We converse with ourselves as we reflect on our previous experience and try to understand it. We converse with teachers to understand their expert knowledge. And we converse with other learners to explore differences and hopefully to try and reach shared understanding. And language is the medium through which we try to reach understanding through conversation. So learning is essentially a conversational practice. Now, he is not the only person to have talked 
about education as a conversational practice, but he is at least the first person to talk about that, those conversations involving machines as well as humans, as involving AI-based machines, even back in the 1970s. So what would be needed for an AI to engage in conversations for learning? Well, the first thing that Pask suggested, and I agree with, is that the AI doesn't need necessarily to have human knowledge or experience to engage in conversations for learning. And I want to suggest that AIs may well have different kinds of experience. You know, they will be continually connected to the World Wide Web. They will be able to access data, um, synthesized data, um, simulated knowledge from other AI systems and from web services. They will be able to synthesize information data from a vast array of different web services and web systems in the way that we as humans can't. So they will bring their own web-based experience to those conversations. So they don't necessarily need to have human knowledge or experience to engage in conversations for learning. But AI do need to support learners, human learners to reach shared understanding through dialogue. That's the minimum that they need to have to be able to support learners to reach shared understanding. So they need to simulate effective social intelligence. So there will be new roles for social generative AI in education. <clears throat> I'm just going to mention one or two of them. So firstly, translanguaging. So there will be real-time speech translation, online meetings or tutorials in multiple language where each participant speaks and hears their own language. So if you imagine, again, a Zoom type conversation where you are speaking in your own language and you're hearing in your own language, but there will be many other participants also speaking and hearing in their own language. And if you're wondering what it sounds like, this is just a simulated version of it using real time Google Translate. So I'm acting as a parent engaging with um, sorry, acting as a teacher, engaging with a Chinese parent. Hello, it's good to talk with you directly. So that's Google Translate translating what I'm saying. Nice to meet you. I just wanted to have a quick conversation about your daughter's progress. She's doing really well at her conversational English classes. And I think next session, we should be going to level four. So that's Google Translate translating my English into Chinese, and in fact, my wife, who is sitting there, who is Chinese, translating her Chinese into my English in real time. Um, and I've actually tried it with her parents in Shanghai, so had conversations with her parents in Shanghai in real time between English and Chinese. So that's one possibility, but of course, it comes with problems. People may come to rely then on machines as interlocutors. Um, and they don't then experience the richness of other languages. It may increase misunderstandings because you have the AI that's mediating between these multiple languages and perhaps introducing not just AI type hallucinations, but mistranslations. And of course, there'll be less incentive to learn another language and with language comes culture. Another role for AI is as a mediator. So the AI moderates the discussion to explore differences and reach agreements. And I showed you that in the demo from OpenAI. But you can, if you have access to ChatGPT or another AI program, you can simulate it yourself. Um, so that's a prompt there. You're an expert mediator and negotiator. I would like you to moderate this discussion amongst five people who will be identified by these letters. The topic of the discussion is, should generative AI be regulated in higher education? And then you can read the rest of the prompt. 
So it's prompting ChatGPT to moderate a discussion. And then ChatGPT replies, yes, that's clear. I'll facilitate the discussion. Um, to start, would anybody like to share their initial thoughts? And all you need to do is then just say, okay, B, um, this is B's response, C's response. So you can already have multiple people who are engaging in a discussion with ChatGPT. And it does a pretty good job of mediating that discussion. So thank you, B&G, for your perspectives and S for expressing your concerns. It's clear we have a range of views. And then deliberately, um, I try to have a more aggressive response. So S saying, what's the point? Uh, AI is going to turn us all into robots. Um, and then G saying, S is an idiot. AI isn't about robots, it's about productivity. And GPT is doing a pretty good job of mediating, moderating that discussion. It's important to re maintain respect in our discussion, recognizing that everyone has valid concerns and perspectives. G emphasizes a view of AI as a productivity tool with the potential to make education more accessible and so on. So already GPT and other AI programs can moderate discussions. It can act as a co-designer. It can assist, for example, a group of students throughout a design process. And I think this is one of the most interesting and valuable roles of AI. It really is a tool for creativity and design. It's not primarily a database or a knowledge-based system. It's a system to support creativity. And you have something called temperature, um, which, many people don't know about. You can adjust the temperature of uh, a chat GPT or other AI system. And the temperature basically means how random or how creative it's going to be. So if you just say in your prompt temperature zero, it's going to be very predictable. If you put temperature one, because it goes from a scale of zero to one, temperature one, it'll be more creative. So you can adjust the creativity. So you can use it as a tool for design while tweaking the creativity. And I put there, brainstorm imaginative ways um, for imaginative quick and easy ways to uh, reduce um, energy. Temperature setting 1.0. So asking it to be more creative. And lastly, as an example, um, very different area. It can help students to summarize, translate, compare and adapt open textbooks. So you can now upload an entire textbook and there are free open source textbooks. So I took two textbooks on African history and uploaded the entire textbooks. So one, an open textbook on the history of African development and the other one, Africans, a history of a continent. Uploaded two entire textbooks and then said, you're an academic historian. Um, I want you to write a text on um, colonialism and African development from a European perspective. And then I asked it to do the same from an African perspective. And it came back with two different responses, two different um, summarizations or extracts, one from a European perspective and one from an African perspective. So you could already do that with AI. You can ask it to take perspectives on textbooks, or on academic papers. So those are some of the ways in which AI can act productively as a tool for social interaction, for creativity, and for perspective taking. And here are just a few further roles for generative AI in education. As a possibility engine to generate alternative ways of expressing an idea, as a Socratic opponent, an opponent in an argument, as a coach for collaboration, lesson planner, quiz generator, social support, personal tutor, dynamic assessor, exploratorium to explore data, and as a storyteller. So these are some roles for AI in education. But I want to finish with exploring then the ethics of social generative AI. So we know now that it's possible, it is possible for AI to engage in conversations for learning. The big question then is, should we allow AI to engage in conversations for learning? 
So AI can effectively simulate social intelligence. It can engage in conversations. It can also change beliefs. So there's a recent paper um, from Costello uh, and colleagues who um, took subjects, participants, who had particular conspiracy beliefs. So these were people who were pre-tested and they had particular beliefs about conspiracies. They then engaged with a discussion with ChatGPT for Turbo. And they found that their conspiracy beliefs were reduced as a result of having those discussions with ChatGPT, even two months after the intervention. So we now know that generative AI can be a powerful tool for reducing conspiracy beliefs. But obviously, of course, it could be the opposite. It could be a powerful tool for increasing conspiracy beliefs or increasing beliefs in any other area. So it can change beliefs. It is also a powerful tool for persuasion. So here's another study from Max et al. Um, they conducted four large scale studies. So these are generative AI scale now, where personalized messages were sent from chat GPT to persuade people uh, in different areas to persuade people to buy products, um, persuade people um, ab about particular stances to take. And they were more effective than non-personalized messages. So we know that social generative AI can engage in conversations, it can change beliefs, and it can persuade people at scale. So as educators, how should we prepare? Well, I want to suggest that teaching is a caring profession. We care about our students. We care about accuracy, integrity, truth. We care about our professional expertise, and we care about human knowledge and experience. And AI is intrinsically uncaring. It doesn't experience human emotions or empathy. It can mimic those behaviors. It's fine tuned, and this is one of the um, achievements of AI companies, which is that they have fine tuned generative AI for accuracy, diversity, and trust. And they've been moderately successful in doing that. But AI is it optimized for efficiency, not care. And by that, I mean that um, AI companies at the moment are competing on the power of their systems and on the efficiency of their system. And you see all these benchmarks that compare the different AI systems. And what it means is that as they become you know, more and more commercially successful and more and more powerful and more and more competitive, then they will need to compete on efficiency more and more. And there is a very interesting paper from Dan Hendricks from the Center for AI Safety, which suggests that in order to be highly efficient, they will need to take humans out of the loop. For example, at the moment, AI systems are communicating with each other in natural language. Um, so, uh, for instance, ChatGPT communicates with DALI, the image generator, in natural English language. To be more efficient, it will need to evolve its own language, which humans won't be able to understand. That's just one example of taking humans out of the loop once AI starts to communicate. And so if we prioritize and prize efficiency, then the danger is that we will then just be taken out of the loop. Um, and uh, I should mention that, uh, for example, the UK Department for Education has produced guidelines um, for use of generative AI based on expert consultancy. And one of the things that came from those guidelines is that teachers should be using or could be using generative AI to make their workload more efficient. And the, the, the rhetoric of efficiency went all the way through that um, government document that teachers, for example, can um, make their lesson planning more efficient. They can reduce their time for lesson planning by using generative AI. What will happen then is that you will then come to rely on generative AI for, um, for your uh, educational, for your routine work. And so you know, 
if you take that to it, the extreme, you will become then you know, part of the machine. You will then work to the tune of AI. So I think we all have to think about what is it that we want to optimize? Do we want to optimize efficiency or do we, do we want to optimize care? So I suggest we need to use generative AI with care. We need to bring human care and empathy to AI and education. We shouldn't reject AI, but I think we should have the confidence as educators to work with AI companies to build models that are based on best pedagogy and inclusive education. Because there are thousands, probably hundreds of thousands now of companies that are developing AI based products for education. Most of them have no clue about how education and how teaching and learning work. We as education professionals have an opportunity to work with some of those companies to debate to base um, AI models on good pedagogy. And by that, I mean just simple things like um, expressing that uh, in its response, an AI should um, work through an answer step by step, or an AI should support the learner to understand the problem, not just to give the answer. So there are some basic ways of training AI that are based on good pedagogy. Uh, and just a little self-promotion, I uh, developed myself a GPT, so it's a, a, a version of chat GPT for teachers called Teach Smart that was based on my book, Practical Pedagogy, 40 New Ways to Teach and Learn. So it's an aid for teachers to help them understand good pedagogy. It's called Teach Smart. You can find it on chat GPT. So we must prepare now for learning in a world of social generative AI. And here are some resources. So um, some papers from myself, uh, a book, Story Machines, How Computers Have Become Creative Writers that I wrote with a colleague, Rafael Perez A. Perez, and a more technical book, An Introduction to Narrative Generators. And I really would recommend the UNESCO, if you haven't seen it, the UNESCO um, guidebook, uh, Chat GPT and Artificial Intelligence in Higher Education, a quick start guide. I really recommend that. So that's what I have to say about social generative AI in education. I think we might have a few minutes for questions and answers. So um, please ask any questions. Thank you. Anyone have any questions? Thank you very much for your talk. It was very inspiring. My question is for this socially, you know, decision making that the artificial intelligence will have. Normally, when we have a discussion, I had a discussion with my partner here. Uh, you have a, a strong point of view on something, and if you ask the the generator or the AI, uh, I, uh, what is your posture on these political views or anything that it requires a social context? You know the environment. What is happening? Uh, I think that is the the like the hurdle that has to be you know jumped to to give uh, you know socially a context to the artificial intelligence. Yes, that's right. Um, so the you know the question or the issue was context, and I think in generative AI context is absolutely important. Um, because you know, any discussion, any social interaction has a context. Now, AIs have been pre-trained and they've also been fine-tuned to take on a particular perspective. And it's interesting when you interact with AI, they seem to have a persona. And that persona now is a kind of um, liberal American persona. If you have an argument with it, and I'm sure you've tried it yourself, if you have an argument with an AI, um, one of the things it tries to do is, you know, it doesn't take an extreme position. It takes a kind of neutral, liberal American position. American because, you know, again, if you give it a cultural perspective, if you try to take a perspective as a European or as a Chinese person, it will definitely have a, an American, a US perspective. So they have been trained, not surprisingly, 
because that's how the fine tuning works. The fine tuning is done with human beings and those human beings are managed by American tech entrepreneurs who are generally kind of liberal American. So they already have a context. They already have a kind of liberal American context. So when you, you know, engage in discussions with them or when your students engage in discussions with them, that's the first thing you need to understand that they're not coming with some you know, neutral perspective. They are already coming with a cultural perspective. Um, now that's not altogether bad because we all come with a cultural perspective, but we need to understand that. And then the second thing is you know, any discussion is rooted in a particular place and time. And yet the AIs were trained um, up to maybe six months ago. They may have be able to access what, you know, recent web services, but they were trained up to a particular point in time that was probably six or nine months ago. So they won't have no training in uh, contemporary issues and contemporary politics, for example. So that's the second thing. So that when we engage socially with AI, we need to understand the context of those discussions. And I think it's really important um, to realize the limitations as well as the opportunities. And the third thing I think, AI is trained as, you know, as a language completer. Um, that's you know, its fundamental um, breakthrough. It will always complete language. So it will be very reluctant to, say, to not answer, to say, I'm not going to answer this question. It will always try to answer your question when it's writing an article. It will always try to continue that article whether it has the knowledge to or not. So again, that's the third thing you need to know that it will always try to continue. Um, whereas humans, you know, if we don't know something, sometimes we just shut up. AIs will not shut up. Um, so we need, you're absolutely right, we need to understand the context of AI and we need our students to understand the context of AI when they engage with them. Any more questions? Yeah, hi, thank you. It's a nice talk, very informative. I was wondering about, since AI, we all know that it's based on data, data we feed it to as computer science experts and all that, we feed this data to the, uh, to the model, to the machine. So basically, since if we decided to leave the decision-making process towards the end, for instance, to if we having a discussion or something like that, and we leave the decision-making process to an AI entity, do you reckon from your experience, it's somehow AI can be biased since the data it's based on a certain context? Thank you. So the question was, is the AI going to be biased because it's trained on you know, data which is not neutral? which is from the web and the web is, as we know, is biased. I think that's a very complicated question. Um, firstly, yes, it is trained on vast amounts of data, more data than we as humans have ever been able to process. And we know that that data is not neutral, that it does have inherent biases. But then they went through this, you know, all of the AI systems we interact with now have gone through this additional process of what's called fine tuning. And fine tuning is rather like trying to make the best of a bad job. So we've got biased data. We, um, they've realized that the AI, AI is biased. Companies such as OpenAI acknowledge this right at the start. And then they try to remove the bias by fine tuning it. And that's been a human process. Um, and it's been a rather messy human process. Some of it's been outsourced we understand to you know, people in Africa and other countries to do that fine tuning. Um, and so you've got a bias system on top of which is an attempt to remove that bias. Um, and so it is going to be problematic. And again, what I would say is that we need to treat it with care. We need to realize the process that's gone through um, in order to get AI to where it is. As for decision making, um, AI, generative AI has never been designed at the outset as a decision making system. It's been designed as a text completion system. However, the additional um, work that companies like AI, OpenAI have done allows it now to receive instructions and to make decisions. And in the future, AI systems will become more hybrid. 
they will have some rule-based decision systems connected to generative AI systems. So they will be more competent at decision making, um, but they will still make mistakes. So therefore, but then humans make mistakes in decision making. So again, it's not a reason to reject them. It's not a reason to say we will not engage with them or to set up barriers, but it is to really treat them with care and to understand what sort of decision making processes they're going through. Anybody else? It's actually a kind of follow up um, on the other question. Uh, I was wondering because it's it's trained that the system is trained. So um, I was wondering if what kind of filter it's there before you put the data into the system. Is there any filter yet uh, um, or not? Yes, that's very interesting. So LNS, are there filters when they're given the initial training? And that depends on the different AI systems. So they, during their initial training, some of them are given initial filtering, and particularly the company Anthropic that developed um, a competitive AI system called Claude. Claude 3.5 is very powerful. That company um, has uh, made a USP about doing pre-training based on ethical principles. So as part of the pre-training, it was given, for instance, the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights, and rather bizarrely, Apple companies terms and conditions um, as pre-training to, um, to uh, try and make it more ethically sound from the outset. So it is possible to give an AI pre-training in ethical principles, which then says, for instance, in your response, respect diversity of views or in your response, um, be, uh, uh, be trustworthy uh, and be respectful. So it is possible now to pre-train AI systems um, on ethical principles. And I think when making choices, and we can make choices now as to which AI system to adopt as individuals and as institutions, we need to understand what sort of principles those AI systems were based on when we make our choices. And I would really urge you to work with your universities um, or, or your education institutions to make informed choices about which AI systems you adopt based on the principles by which they were trained. I think we've run out of time, so thank you. Thank you.